Well, good morning. We're right in the middle of the Labor Day weekend. Like so many of our three-day weekends, that tends to mean different things to different people. For a lot of kids, it means going back to school this week. There are others who see this as a time to get out and enjoy the last weekend of the summer. But for others, it's time to recognize the achievements of American workers, and especially those who pioneered the labor movement in this country. We'll do that this morning, and we're also going to be taking a look back, way back, at an Olympic memory. It all starts right now. From TV6, this is The Ryan Report. Now, here's your host, Don Ryan. Well, the roots of organized labor are very deep in Upper Michigan. Early miners in the copper and iron industries fought legendary efforts to win the rights to organize and improve wages and working conditions in the mining industry. In the years to follow, other unions became part of the fabric, representing workers on the railroads and the building trades, communications, the ladies' garment workers, and more. But what's happening today? We're going to talk about that with our guest this morning, Mike Tebow. Mike is the president of the Upper Peninsula Regional Labor Federation. Mike, welcome to the Ryan Report. Thank you, Don. It's good to be here, and thanks for the invitation. Good to have you with us. What, uh, what first brought you into the labor movement, Mike? Well, I guess I was one of those lucky kids that uh, uh, I lived in a locale that uh, had a lot of building trades folks uh, in the community. Uh, a couple of them took me under their wing and got me into an apprentice program with the iron workers. And 47 years later, wow. here I am. Uh, so I guess you could say I made a career out of it. You've probably put up a lot of steel. Huh? I, I have. I uh, had the opportunity to work on both the uh, mine facilities, the Empire and the Tilden. When I first showed up at the Tilden, it was just a rock pile. Sure, and, sure. Uh, Got to work on the ore, ore storage facilities, both of those, and concentrate buildings and, and whatnot, and, and a lot of ongoing maintenance that we assist the steel workers with at different times. Sure. And uh, you know, it's been uh, it's been a it's a shame to hear about the empire. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in just sure. a minute. Um, and those probably back in the days when when you went to school, they gave you some things to work on with your hands too, wasn't it? Be yeah, it, it manual was, training or industrial training, I think is what they called it around here. Uh, yes, we uh, of course we had a school uh, shop that we right, attended, shop uh, classes. and uh, uh, welding uh, got our welding certificates in place there, and and learned a lot of a lot of the crafts. Uh, do the same thing in their apprentice programs. You right. know that that's where you really learn the nuts and bolts of uh, how you perform on the job, and and. Uh, and the etiquette of working on a job. Certainly. You know, in, in recent years, organized labor has experienced some, some wins and some losses. H how do you see the state of the labor movement here on this Labor Day weekend? Uh, actually, I, I, I'm real optimistic, Don. I, I, I sense a tick up uh, yeah, for the labor movement, uh, you know, uh, based on uh, just the, the opportunities that are out there right now. Uh, maybe not as much in the public sector, but in the private sector, uh, there's a lot of growth, uh, especially in the Marquette County area uh, and other areas of the UP. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're like any other region of the of the state and, and the country. Uh, you know, through technology and and uh, businesses uh, shipping. Uh, overseas to manufacture overseas and in Mexico and that there's that's the downside we've, we've lost membership uh, but that seems to be changing now and and the membership is now growing again uh, and yeah. that's kind of what led into uh, the art the regional labor body I was going to say before we get to that that clearly you know there are differences between labor and management over the years but uh, there, there's no question that organized labor did so much to raise the standard of living and create safe working conditions in this country when we go back to all the many years the labor movement has been active. Uh, some of the general public doesn't understand that, you know, it is organized labor that really sets the bar down uh, for st wage standards in an area. Uh, and you know we we don't discriminate against uh, open shop or non-union workers. We we feel anybody that's performing a, a trade or 
providing a service uh, deserves to be paid well, receive good benefits, family sustaining uh, uh, insurance and benefits. And uh, so it, it's our goal to assist local unions and organizations uh, that represent people in the workforce to reach that. Okay, and what is the UP Regional Labor Federation? What is this organization? Fairly new? Uh, it's two years old, okay. and uh, it, it was formed uh, out of, uh, I, I hate to say necessity, but it was necessity. We uh, Formerly, we had six central labor bodies covering the UP, one on the eastern end, the western end, Menominee County, uh, Delta County, Dickinson County, and Marquette County. <clears throat> And through loss of membership uh, and, quite honestly, interest at, at different points, you know, it's all volunteer work, uh, people that work on these councils and chair the councils. And uh, so we started losing membership and involvement. Uh, and the national AFL-CIO made a decision to form regional bodies. Uh, we still have five community councils active in the UP but they're under the umbrella of the Upper Peninsula Regional Body. Okay. So, uh, you know, and we, and we assist the local community councils uh, in whatever actions they're in, into or uh, projects they're involved with. Uh, seems to be growing. We, we've grown our affiliation since the body was formed. Okay. Uh, we have... Uh, 69 local unions uh, that represent 12,500 members. Uh, at one time, uh, we were a lot lower than that. Um, okay. so. We'll find out about some of the things you're involved in in just a couple of minutes. Back okay. with more on the Ryan Report after we take this break. Our guest this morning is Mike Tebow, the president of the uh, UP Regional Labor Federation. Mike, what are some of the things the Federation's involved in? I, I know, for example, you're working closely with legislators and government. Too. Uh, yes, we've been able to uh, get commitment from our UP legislators to meet with the uh, Federation on a quarterly basis, and we've been doing that for two years, uh, to talk about issues that affect working families. Uh, as you know, uh, a lot of legislation in the last few years uh, at the state level, uh, we feel we're damaging to to labor, and and discovered that you know without dialogue with with our legislators and and sharing our thoughts and, and our needs, uh, that was going to continue. So uh, we started these quarterly meetings, and uh, all of them have been very receptive to attending those meetings, and uh, okay. we get some good work done with them. I know one of the issues you're also concerned about was the big box store issue. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, everybody's probably aware now of the tr tax tribunal's uh, decisions. Uh, uh, someone discovered uh, a loophole right. uh, in the tax law that allowed uh, corporations to, retail corporations to apply for a dark store status. Uh, and it's, it's really, you know, it, it affects our communities, Don, so much uh, in revenue. For example, uh, <clears throat> Peter White Library had right. to close one of their days of service to the community, right. uh, lost staff. And, and that continues to go in that direction. And, uh, you know, there's some legislation uh, in place or, or being offered and acted on uh, that is going to try to close that loophole somewhat. But, you know, and, and the Regional Labor Federation has been involved with two groups, the uh, Save Marquette, Save Michigan group, uh, which is the Bright Store effort, and also the Marquette County Citizens for Fair Share. Uh, <clears throat> those two uh, entities are hosting the premiere of Boxed In. Uh, it's a short documentary done by Dwight Brady from NMU and his students uh, that exposes the uh, efforts by the tax tribunal and the corporations uh, to enjoy this benefit. Uh, we feel that, 
you know, typically a corporation, a retail corporation moves into the area, they get tax breaks to begin with, and then they apply for, for this loophole. And, you know, it affects services, uh, it, it affects the community greatly. Uh, now the Bright Store folks, the Save Market, Save Michigan, have actually signed up 170 stores, local stores in the area that uh, have made a commitment not to apply for those kind okay. of tax breaks. Okay. We're going to have to move along because I do sure. want to mention Empire Mine. I, I know you're actively involved there as well. Yes. We're trying to find more opportunities for the sure. workers. Sure. In fact, next week we'll be working with, uh, alongside Michigan Works and some other agencies to uh, share thoughts with the displaced workers uh, on possible opportunities, primarily uh, in the building trades. Okay. We're going to be looking for some help with all the work uh, in the area. Uh, there's apprentice programs available uh, and, and different ways to slot into the work that that we think we have something to offer and, and uh, I'll be there talking to some of the steel workers that are going to be displaced and, and sharing what what I know about the apprentice programs and availability. And we don't want to forget to mention that you have a big Labor Day celebration coming up in Ishpeming which is actually tomorrow. Our 27th uh, and we'll be uh, we're excited about it. We've held it in Ishpeming now, I, I think, 13 or 14 years. And uh, we welcome the community to, to come and participate. You don't have to be a union member. Bring your family. We have uh, uh, adult beverages and uh, children beverages and, and some food. Parades uh, and a big picnic. Parades and a big picnic. And uh, we'll even have some some political speakers, it is an election year again. Right, and, right. And they'll be uh, doing their spiel, and uh, it's it's a good day. It's not a long day, but uh, by the end of the day, everybody's worn out and ready to go home. Uh, so one other thing I would like to mention, if you don't mind, Don, okay. uh, we're doing a, a fall labor conference at, at Northern Michigan University. Uh, we've typically done these through the years. Uh, this year, it, it's being designed and a lot of focus by young workers okay. uh, that are coming into the workforce, have recently joined the workforce. And we're very honored to have uh, Liz Schuler, who is the secretary treasurer of the national AFL-CIO is gonna be our keynote speaker on Saturday. Uh, and again, anybody that's interested, uh, there's information out there available on how to attend. And uh, we're very excited about it. Okay, sounds like some big events coming up. Thanks You're very right. much for coming in and sharing this morning. You're welcome, and thanks for the opportunity. Okay, and happy Labor Day. Happy Labor Day, okay. Doc. I'll be back with uh, an Olympic memory from the distant past after we take this break. Well, the Summer Olympics are behind us, not to be heard from again for another four years. Among the memorable moments were those special times when U.S. athletes experienced the excitement of winning a medal. It's a very special feeling that few get to enjoy. On a much earlier edition of the Ryan Report, I had a chance to talk with someone who shared that experience. Peekaboo Street was a gold medal winner in downhill skiing in Japan in 1998. As a wrap up on the Olympics, I thought it would be fun to bring back part of that interview. The setting looks a little different, but it was an interesting conversation. And I asked Peekaboo Street to describe the feeling that came with winning her gold medal. It was a superstar moment, honestly. It really, it felt really euphoric almost. It was kind of dreamy-like, and um, you had to kind of pinch yourself and say, wow, did that really just happen? Am I, you know, did I really just accomplish what I've wished on 11-11 on the clock? I've wished on stars. I've, I've been wishing and wishing and wishing and hoping and wishing all of my life for this moment that is, that is happening right now. And I'm such a patriotic person, too, that it was such an amazing honor. And I didn't really feel like it would hit me as hard as it did when they announced, you know, Peekaboo Street, United States of America, Olympic gold medal, and up goes the flag, and here comes our national anthem yeah. in my honor. And it just um, was absolutely one of the most beautiful moments I've, I've ever been a part of. And the coolest thing is my brother and my dad were there to experience it with me, and that was very, very neat because my whole career has been a big family effort. 
you, you kind of you said that in the book that everything that was important to you was there your family yeah. your country yeah. your your my mom your was missing team. right my mom yeah. was missing yeah. but uh, someone had to hold down the home for it so you know you said that for ski racers there's kind of a fine line between uh, going for it and holding back yeah obviously uh, obviously confidence is, has to be a huge part of absolutely a downhill ski is skier's right career can, can you tell us about that? there's a certain amount of love for that speed and love for the fall line that i've found as a common denominator in a lot of the speed demons that i've met in my life whether it be um ski racers or car racers um you know even even some of the freestyle skiers that ski moguls, it's surprising how much speed they actually get and accomplish while they're on their runs. And there has to be a love for it, I think. I think it's really difficult to come into it being fearful and nervous and not really loving all of that speed and all that fall line. And so I felt like I had an advantage in a way by having such a, a love for that speed and, and being able to wrap my brain around it and being very comfortable there. And um, a lot of people think I'm crazy, and yet I kind of equate crazy with, with stupid moves, and I don't consider what I did stupid. I took a lot of the precautions that needed to be in place in order to fatten my margin for error. Um, I just think that I really am okay at a fast speed, and my brain can process everything that's coming and really, and really love it. And so... Um, so the key is to kind of take it to the edge but not beyond? Absolutely. And the thing is, is you have to go beyond the edge in order to know exactly where it is. And when you're winning and losing by one one hundredth of a second, you have to know right where that minuscule line lies and be able to get right to it and ski just this side of it. Um, but every now and again, you have to cross it in order to, to keep track of where it is. And that's where some of the injuries come into play. But I fell ten times more than I got injured. You know, I walked away from some pretty horrific looking crashes. Um, and that was just me testing that line and, and right. finding it. And did you go beyond the line in Switzerland when you suffered the, the terrible accident? Absolutely, and absolutely. And I, when I first looked at that jump in Crowns Montana, Switzerland, I, I had a funky feeling in my stomach like, wow, this is awkward. And we had new skis, and I knew that they were going to turn back more and I just the whole trajectory just kind of felt funky on the turn and so it was kind of a it didn't flow if you will you know how when you when you put water through a bunch of rocks it kind of has this beautiful flow the way it goes and a lot of downhill courses that are set with the terrain on the mountain feel that same way you kind of feel like water flowing down the natural terrain and there are certain courses that have parts that feel funny like they're going to slow everything down and it's really hard to even visualize yourself flowing through it nicely let alone be able to physically make that happen as well and so i knew that it was going to be a weird spot and um, we only had one training run so i only had one kind of test run at it and then everything gets the switch gets thrown and everything you know intensifies greatly on race day and so I went in there almost a full second faster than I had in training and I just I misjudged it it was just pilot error and uh, part of it was because my brain and my heart and my emotions were still in America and still with my family wishing that I was kind of you know, still in that patting myself on the back for what I had accomplished zone but it was scary being satisfied and being content was a very scary place for me it wasn't somewhere where I thrived often so I kind of ran away from it and back into skiing and that's what got me in trouble there were there any disappointments in your life I think everybody always has disappointments in their life but when you look back on it without those disappointments there's a lack of growth and so I look back on it with a glass half full attitude and say the things that I've accomplished in my life the things that I've missed out on uh, the disappointments that I've had and the successes I've had have rounded me out and made me the person that I am today and I can honestly say I don't think I would change anything. Peekaboo Street, Olympic gold medal winner in the Winter Games in 1998. That was part of one of my favorite interviews ever. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back with some thoughts about school days after this break. Remember the old song, school days, school days, dear old golden rule days, reading and writing and arithmetic, taught to the tune of the hickory stick. That song, which actually predates me, pretty well encapsulates the theme of my message this morning, which is that in schools, some things change and many things remain the same. 
it's still pretty much reading, writing, and arithmetic, although we don't have the hickory stick around anymore. But it is that time of year again. After the last holiday weekend of the summer, most kids in Michigan head back to school on Tuesday morning. In some states, school has already been in session for a week or two. But Michigan schools are basically required to start the new year after Labor Day. It seems like a lot of things about schools never change. Kids everywhere in this country have been going back to school about this time of year since they opened the first school in Massachusetts in the 1600s. There's occasional talk about changing the school year, and I think some states may have even experimented with some options. But I think for most places, we have to get the kids out of school for the summer so they can go work in the farm fields, as they did in earlier generations. Obviously, not many kids are working in the farm fields today, or anywhere for that matter. Anyway, the first day of school affects people in different ways. The mom sending her first daughter off to kindergarten might be anxious and even sad to see her go. By the time the kids get to later elementary or middle school, most parents can't wait to send them out the door for the first day of school in the fall. Surprisingly, one of the things that seems to have changed is math. Now, you wouldn't think something that's been with us for all these years would actually change. It's true that two and two is still four, but when it comes to multiplication and division, they've changed the way you're supposed to solve the problem. I think it's actually a plot against parents and grandparents. As I'm guessing some of you have experienced, the answers are still the same. It's the way you do the problem that's changed. When you're helping your granddaughter, for example, it's frustrating when you know what the answer is, but can't explain how to get there with the new systems. It's like learning math all over again. A couple of thoughts as I look back on my own school days. One of the common problems is that kids don't understand why we have to learn that, and that that could be almost any subject. One of those for me was history. It just seemed like a lot of dates that really didn't have much meaning to me. But as I became an older adult, and I think this happens to a lot of people, I really enjoy, began to enjoy history, especially as the history related to me. Then there was English. I always had a lot of trouble with that. I probably would have had a, di a different attitude if I had known that one day I would be writing things like this. Just think how much better it would be if I could have actually paid attention in Miss Vivian's English class. It's too late to go back now, but I'll be back in two minutes. About time to wrap things up. Thanks to Mike Tebow for coming in today to talk to us about Labor Day, a very important celebration for many American families. That's our show. The Today Show is coming up next. Thank you for joining us. I hope we see you again right here next Sunday morning.